Well, hello class. The next thing that we need to talk about is this definition or this term called chemical shift. So when we take a look at this molecule here, benzene, we see that there's six protons and those six protons give us one signal shown right here. Now on that signal, what we say, hey, we those protons right there, the six protons on benzene gives us a chemical shift at around 7.2 ppms. Now ppms stands for parts per million. Let's write that down. Parts per million. Okay. So the x-axis is is the x-axis title is parts per million and we can refer to that as a chemical shift. Now parts per million or chemical shift whatever you choose to uh, use uh, these numbers on the x-axis is telling us the frequency at which these protons in benzene resonate. Now, what else that we have here is this TMS reference. Okay. Now, TMS stands for trimethylsilane. And trimethylsilane looks like this. It has a silicon atom in the middle. And then you can imagine four methyl groups. So there we have the tetramethylsilane. And tetramethylsilane, or TMS, is used as a reference. Okay. So when we stick benzene into the NMR without TMS, it does not show up at 7.2 ppms. What has to happen is the NMR has to have a reference point. And so TMS is the reference point. You see that there are 12 hydrogens on tetramethylsilane. And what we do is when we take the tri tetramethylsilane and have that in the NMR, and it gives us a signal for those 12 protons, the computer just says, hey, the signal from those 12 protons, we're going to call that zero. So that's what you see right here at zero is the TMS. And then when we do the experiment with the benzene, the chemical shift of benzene is in reference to the TMS peak. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Typically in the past, if you wanted to do an NMR of benzene, you would put benzene in your NMR tube, and then you would add a little bit of TMS to your sample, and you'd run both at the same time. And then you'd get this NMR. But now we have the technology where we don't have to use the TMS standard directly in our sample. It's just computed uh, in the, the system. So now we're to the point where we don't have to add TMS to our sample, but there's still a TMS reference that is used. So that's chemical shift. So how do we calculate chemical shift? What is the numbers actually? Okay. So we can see the numbers of chemical shift is right here. There's the definition of chemical shift in parts per million. Now we have three components here. We have the frequency of your sample. That's the frequency at which your protons resonate. Okay. And then we have this term right there. That's the frequency at which the tetramethylsilane resonates at. And then this VOP and the OP stands for operation or operating frequency of the NMR instrument. 
And <clears throat> that right there kind of tells us the strength of the magnet. You remember how we could have a weak magnet and a strong magnet? So that, that's going to be constant. It just depends what instruments you have. Okay. Now, so that's how you uh, calculate parts per million. So you can see everything is in terms of a frequency. And every term in that frequency is going to be measured in hertz. When you take those, take the difference and then divide it you have to multiply it by 10 to the 6, and that's the million. That's where the parts per million comes from, because you're multiplying it by a million. Now, why... I have a question. If we had an NMR spectrum right here, okay? That was a poorly drawn line. And say we have a, a signal there for some protons. Why could we not have the x-axis in hertz? Why could we not just have frequencies all the way down there, okay, and measured in hertz? Why is that not a good thing, okay? Why do we have it actually measured in parts per million instead? Why is that the way that we do it? Because remember, I just said that these numbers right here tells us the frequency at which the protons resonate. But then why don't we use frequency or hertz? Well, let me walk you through that. And it's kind of cool as to why we use parts per million instead. So let's look at, we're going to compare two NMR instruments, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to look at the exact same molecule. The only difference is we're going to use a 300 megahertz instrument versus a 600 megahertz instrument. Now this is very, very important. We are using the same molecule in each instrument. And it doesn't matter which molecule it is for this example. Okay. So let's say we do our, our 300 megahertz instrument first. And so let's draw an energy level. Okay. And let's say we have two protons there in the alpha state. Okay. Now we know that in NMR, if we take a frequency or in this, or NMR is a radio frequency, okay? Let's say we zap the molecule with, let's say, three hertz of energy. What's going to happen? Well, we're going to have a spin flip. And so we'll take one of those protons and we will spin flip it, okay? And so then, hey, we would get a readout. Let's move this up on our NMR spectrum, we'll get a signal at 3 hertz. Okay, so 3 hertz. Well, let's say we take that exact same molecule okay, and place that same molecule in a 600 megahertz instrument. Well, with a stronger magnet, what's going to happen? Remember that the energy difference between the spin states. So let's look at it this way. So the change in energy of the spin states is proportional is proportional to the external magnetic field. So stronger the magnet makes that gap right here larger. Now because that gap now is larger it's going to take more energy to do a spin flip. So remember, it's the same molecule, but now 3 hertz of energy is not going to get a spin flip in the 600 megahertz instrument. It's going to take more. So let's say 6 hertz. So now we zap that same molecule 
with 6 hertz of energy, and it will get those same protons to resonate. So now we're going to have, for the 600 megahertz instrument, we're going to have the same molecule, but now those protons are going to resonate at 6 hertz. Do you see the problem here? The same molecule on different instruments are going to give us different answers. So that's going to be very problematic when everyone around the world may look at the exact same molecule and they all get this all get a different answer. That's going to be a problem. And so what we do is we use parts per million because it normalizes everything. If it is, let's say, aspirin, you will get the same chemical shifts for all the protons in aspirin if you use a 300 megahertz instrument or a 600 megahertz. It does not matter what instrument you use. You will always get the same answer. And that has to do with the formula here. There. So let's let me show that to you with what we've done here. So if we go 3 hertz, that's the frequency at which the protons resonated with. So let's actually rewrite it so we can follow the uh, this right here. So I'm going to take a little screenshot here and come back here. There. Okay. So frequency of the sample was 3 hertz minus the TMS standard. And in this instrument, it was 1 hertz divided by the frequency, which was 300 megahertz, okay, all multiplied by 10 to the sixth. And that's going to equal, I'm just going to simplify it down here. Okay, so that's everything right there simplifies down to that number right there. Okay. Now let's do this one over here. Okay. Just double checking my numbers here. So it's 6 hertz. And the TMS standard in the 600 megahertz resonated at 2 hertz divided by 600 megahertz times 10 to the 6. And that will also simplify down to this. Do you see how that number and that number is exactly the same? That is why we use parts per million, because it normalizes everything. And everyone will get the same result despite what NMR instrument that they have. Pretty cool. We have another term called downfilled and upfilled. Okay. Now, when we look at an NMR spectrum shown here, the chemical shifts or the parts per million, they increase from right to left. So that's not intuitive for what we're used to seeing on a number line, right? But this isn't a number line. It goes from left or sorry, from right to left in increasing order. Now, what we have here is if we have a signal okay, that has higher numbers or higher chemical shifts, we call that downfilled. So this right here, this signal right here is downfilled from, say, that peak. Now, if your signal is closer to the TMS reference, we call that peak upfield. So downfield, upfield. Okay. Those are another set of terms that we need to understand.
So going back to benzene, we see that there are six protons, but we only see one signal for those six protons. And that is because each one of these protons is homotopic. So that means that they're equivalent. And when you have equivalent protons, it does not matter how many protons there are. If they're all equivalent, then they give one signal. So if I gave this molecule on the test and asked you, how many signals would you expect for benzene? The answer would be one signal, even though there is a second signal for the TMS reference. So whenever I ask you how many signals do you expect for a molecule, you never, ever include the reference. So benzene, because all six hydrogens are homotopic, it gives one signal. Now you may be asking, well, how, Dr. Lawrence, how do you know that those protons are homotopic? I haven't taught you yet how to analyze and figure that out yet. All right? So don't worry, we'll get there. You just need to understand this concept that if the protons are homotopic, they give us one signal. Now, if you look at this molecule right here, you can see that there are two signals, that signal for that proton and this signal right here for that proton. So there are a total of two protons in this molecule. It gives us two signals, and that is because these two protons right here are heterotopic. They are not in the same chemical environment. We can see that this proton is directly attached to an oxygen compared to this hydrogen, which is directly attached to an SP hybridized carbon. It's a different chemical environment. There's different attachments. So we will get two signals. So I want to say this one more time because it's so important and I know I'm repeating myself. If I gave you this molecule on the exam and I asked you how many signals do you expect, you would say two. You would not say three because there's that third one right there. That's just the reference. If you ever see a signal at zero, you were not counting it. Okay. Okay, so this next little section right here, this is how we're going to figure out if protons are homotopic or heterotropic. Okay. So I'm going to stop the video here and we'll discuss that in the next video.